Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, good morning um, from Washington, D.C. I am Paolo von Schirach, the president of the Global Policy Institute uh, and the chair of uh, Political Science and International Relations at Bay Atlantic University in Washington, D.C. And it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to this uh, um, event uh, that is uh, continuing our uh, focus on African sustainable agriculture, and um, uh, which has been organized by our good friend, uh, Adam. Uh, and I was thinking, Adam, I know this has got nothing to do with anything, but the first time we met, we were discussing the environmental impact of a gas pipeline in Peru. So there you go. <laughs> we are changing subject here. But this is a long time ago, just a reminiscing how long we've known each other. So um, we are now going to introduce uh, our, our uh, distinguished guests and panelists who are here today. You've received uh, in the flyers and the invitations, their bios, which are quite extensive and, and, and quite significant in terms of their contribution to, uh, to this uh, particular topic of women empowerment in agriculture in, in, in Africa. Um, I will turn over in a moment uh, to the, the, the proceedings to Adam, who will serve as a, as moderator. But just let me say, you know, a couple of things about, you know, since we've known each other such a long time, and Adam has been in this uh, business of development for many, many years, uh, you know, focusing on so many different aspects of it. But I just uh, wanted to remind everybody that right now, Adam is serving as a CEO of Gateway Development International, which is a, a US-based international development advisory firm um, pro, uh, that uh, focused on staffing, proposal writing, other aspects of business development, including fundraising and business linkages advisory services. So now this is his new, let's say his new incarnation. <laughs> Good luck with that, uh, Adam. And um, with that, uh, I'll leave it to you to moderate uh, this, uh, this uh, distinguished panel, which, uh, you know, you very kindly put together and organized and connecting with our guests uh, today, joining us uh, from West Africa. Adam, over to you. Thank you, Paolo, and welcome to the panelists and the team at Bay Atlantic University and the Global Policy Institute and those of you who have tuned in. Um, this is the third webinar in a series focusing on sustainable agriculture in Africa. Today's one hour program comprises presentations from three highly qualified and successful African professionals who focus on the vast socioeconomic challenges, opportunities, and potential women have in African agriculture. And after living in Africa for most of the past 30 years, uh, I can assure you that women are the continent's greatest and most underserved resource. So the format of today's session is that each speaker will make a brief presentation followed by uh, questions and answers from the audience. So feel free to type in your questions at any time. We'll address those at the end of the hour, um, but please feel free to type in your questions via the, the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen. I will get those and then I will uh, will state your questions. Please include uh, your name and organization if you can. And just to set the stage for today's, today's uh, webinar, I think many of the people watching know, but not all, that Africa holds 60% of the world's remaining arable land. With abundant sunshine and plentiful rainfall and fertile soil to optimize yields and harvests, there can be massive job creations, local development, and deliver significant value for shareholders in African agriculture. People are investing more and more, realizing the potential that food and food business, agribusiness has on the world, and of course, the ubiquitous need for food and nutritional security. However, due to a lack, I don't know, for a variety of reasons, many of you know, women who happen to supply a significant portion of the labor regarding growing, harvesting, and processing food are often disadvantaged with unequal access to finance, investment, training, and decision-making. Um, so looking into the future, when it comes to shaping research agendas and setting priorities, 
decision making and leadership uh, in agricultural research and development, women are heavily underrepresented and we're trying to see what can be done to uh, address that. So as Paolo said, rather than spe spend spe precious time on going through everybody's introduction, please look at the invitation, look at the profiles, and let's jump right in with Ivana Osagi. Ivana, Ivana is, the, is the founder of PWR Advisory, a leading African diversity and inclusion consultancy and advocacy firm. She, she's incredible. You know, she focuses on accelerating gender equity and helping organizations build their female talent pools. She also coaches women on executive presence and leadership to optimize their visibility uh, in today's competitive business landscape, including the public sector. Previously, she spent more than 25 years as a C-suite executive and held senior roles in the UK and in Nigeria at PA Consulting, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, HSBC, and most recently, Notore Chemical Industries. Ivana, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'd like to just start off the question from your perspective, or, or what do you feel are the top three challenges women face in the agricultural sector? Thank you very much, Adam. Good evening, everybody. Really nice to be here with you tonight. Um, I think the first point I'd like to make is that when we talk about agriculture, many people think about farming, but actually agriculture cuts across a whole gamut of um, activities. And I think we really need to start thinking more about the value chain when we talk about agriculture. So we talk about primary production, which is where farming comes in. And then we talk about processing and there's manufacturing and then there's packaging and marketing um, and ultimately the final product would get into the hands of the um, end consumer. And of course, inside of all of that, we also have aggregation where we have people who aggregate products that they, um, they collect from farmers. And women operate across the whole spectrum of the value, the value chain. Women make up about 60% of the um, workforce in their cultural um, space. And if you talk about processing, then that number rises because women do a lot of processing, especially at, um, at the primary level. I would say that one of the um, main challenges that women face is the same challenge that women face in other sectors, which is financing. The Development Bank tells us that there's a 42 billion US dollar financing gap between male and female entrepreneurs. And I dare say that agriculture also faces, is part of that gap. Um, agriculture involves lots of developmental work. Um, and I'll come, I'll come back to that in a bit. Another um, challenge that women face is access to land or land rights. In many parts of the continent, women are not allowed to own land. And so the woman doesn't own land and she, she, she therefore does not have that agency that she needs. She's not involved in decision making. She doesn't have any control over what happens on the land. I mean, and you see when she gets into say primary production, for instance, and she's investing, she doesn't have much control over what happens and over the returns on her investment. So that's another challenge that women face as a matter I think something else is the level of sexism. I think culturally, um, it's quite a patriarchal society. And in, in many cases, women don't um, have the opportunity to get involved in enterprise because of uh, permission from their husbands, for instance. Back again to the issue of finance, what we find is that even for women who run SMEs, which obviously are uh, a few levels higher than micro enterprises, many of the people who make the financing decisions are men. And we women entrepreneurs complain about being told why are you coming to ask for money from a bank? Why don't you go and ask your husband? So these are some of the challenges that women face. Um, I think the other, the other thing to talk about is also access to markets. A lot of times um, women are able to produce, but um, they do not have sufficient access to markets. So those are some of the top challenges that women face um, in agriculture. You muted, Adam. Sorry about that. And these are embedded challenges that have been that have been in place for years. What are some of the things you've seen to, to resolve or at least start to address these challenges? So um, I think one of the things that we see is the, the, the deployment of technology, because I think technology can make a big difference. Um, 
say for instance, mobility solutions, especially as we start to see more climate change um, solutions come to the fore, women then have more time to spend um, in revenue or income generating activity because they're not that much, in, they, they don't, they're not spending too much time. You know, when we talk about smallholder farmers, they don't have to spend too much time walking long distances to get water or labor in labor intensive activities. So they are released from that burden and they have more time to spend on income generation. Another thing that I have seen happen is that we have seen a growth in, on the, um, in impact investing. We see more deployment of what I would call catalytic capital, which is typically more patient and more risk um, accommodating. You know, there's a lot of developmental work involved, like I said, when it comes to agriculture. And so when we have programs that are targeted at women and we have investment that, is, that deploys patient capital, then women are able to, are empowered and are able to do a lot more. Um, there's a lot more focus on gender lens investing as well. So we see that female entrepreneurs are getting easier access to funding than they did say three years ago. But there's still a long way to go. There's still a lot more um, that we need to do, you know, to, to change the space and break that 42 billion US dollar gap that exists between men and women. And, and you know, I know there are examples around the world of, of, of almost, you know, in every sector, there's a couple of stars, but there are a lot of stars, I believe, in Africa, African women. And I'm wondering if, if there are any examples that you have of, of women building successful models. And also, more importantly, because we're not going to know who they are and not everybody's an expert in maize or cashew or cassava or sour gum, what, what the... What do you think are the key success factors that these women had in order for them to get where they're going? So when we talk about success factors, I would say that the biggest success factor women need is persistence. Grit. It's a long haul. And so that is one thing that women need. You know, so we find that there are lots and lots of obstacles, but you have to keep going. Um, I think the first, the first example I want to give is an example of a share butter co-op, which comprises uh, over 600 women in Ghana, who supply share butter through um, a scheme called the Fair Trade, I think it's called Fair Trade, um, Fair, Fair Trade Community or Fair Community Trade, I don't remember. Fair which. Trade Initiative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so they supply um, share butter to the body shop. And that, is a, that, that has been successful because what has happened is that there's been a clustering of women because as women, as individuals, the women do not have that level of empowerment. They don't have the capacity, um, you know, to access the opportunities. But by clustering those women together, which again, at that low level, um, is another critical success factor, being able to cluster women together. You know, they say that um, if you want to go far, you know, find someone to go with. And, and, and that certainly works when it comes to smallholder farmers. So that co-op supplied share butter and have been doing so for many years. And also that scheme also invests in um, community projects to change the, the, the lifestyle of, of, of the community, generally speaking. Another one I want to talk about is Real Fruit, which is run by a lady called Afi Williams, based here in Nigeria. What she does is that she um, processes fruit she dries fruit and supplies it into shops and she actually exports into Europe, into the US and also into Saudi Arabia. So that is another success story. She has successfully raised some funding from investors and I dare say she's going to scale even further. Another example I'd like to give is a company that I chair called Amai Foods. Amai Foods provides what we call halfway halfway foods, if you like. So they're foods which um, cater for convenience. We have a lot of um, young people who are very busy and don't have time to cook African food from scratch. And so they do the primary processing and provide a halfway product, which then means that it takes, it's faster for people to prepare the food they want to eat when they come back from work. And they also, Amai Foods also exports into the diaspora. So they export into Europe and also into the US. So those are some of the um, success stories that we have for women. And, and these entrepreneurs are all women I, I've talked about. Fantastic, fantastic. I, th I think, Ivana, we're, we're gonna have to move on and uh, to the next speaker, but I think you, you know, 
Having lived in Nigeria quite recently, I know the good work you are doing in giving women farmers a voice, as well as, you know, a better chance of getting skills and access to finance and training and, and opportunities. Um, so, you know, I think that your, your, your work is uh, the realized potential and fair, transparent op system with a, a level playing and paying field is, is, uh, is impressive. And certainly the world needs more of Ano Um Thank you. Very kind uh, of you today, sir. You're welcome. Our next speaker is Mary Afan. Uh, Mary is the president of the Small Scale Women's Farmers Organization, also in Nigeria and is the vice chairman of the Women's uh, Rural, I might've got the name wrong, but the Women's Rural Farmers Forum. Um, she's also a farmer, um, a longtime farmer. So she's experienced the challenges that uh, women face firsthand. And when not farming, she dedicates her time to advocating for the rights of rural smallholder farmers, women in terms of obtaining access to the resources they need to uh, assume leadership positions. Welcome, Mary. And uh, thank, you so thank you for being here today. Yes, um, I do. I'm going to ask the same question, perhaps, but uh, it, uh, that I started with with Ivana, which is from your perspective, you know, what are the main challenges facing women farmers? Though, let's that's your your focus. So, not agribusiness, not processing, aggregating, and exporting. But what are the main challenges facing women farmers uh, that you find in, in Nigeria and generally in Africa today? Thank you very much, uh, Adams. You're um, welcome. I, I want to appreciate your effort to making sure that this uh, program takes place. For pressure putting on me to make sure that my details are all available. Thank you so much. Uh, I am Mary Afan, the National President of Small Scale Women Farmers Organization in Nigeria. Uh, this is a platform of over 500,000 cooperative court across all the 36 states, including FCT in Nigeria. It's a movement of women farmers that uh, decided to come together to be able to speak with one voice, to advocate to government on the need for increased investment in the agri sector in favor of smallholder women farmers. Uh, this come across because the challenges we are facing, just like Ivana said, uh, are categorized basically in two sections. One is the socio-cultural factors, uh, which has to do with the issue of access and control of land and land resources. As a woman farmers, just like Ivana said, some cultural norms don't allow us to inherit land. And even when we have access to land, you can control the land and land resources. You can only either hire the land or you plant crops that you can produce within three to five months. You cannot plant cash crop in that land because the owner of that land will not allow you. And it becomes a major, major constraint for us to be able to practice the agri we want to do. And for it is a known fact that it is the smallholder farmers that feed the nation. But when it comes to the issue of them having access to land and control of land, including land resources, it becomes very, very difficult for them. And that is why we have been advocating to the government of Nigeria, including Africa, as you were told, I'm the a vice president of the Rural Women Farmers Forum, the continental platform consisting of 28 African countries. We've been advocating on the need for government, you know, to review the land law system that denies a woman from controlling or inheriting land. The second factor that affects smallholder farmer is economic factors. Number one, having access to finance, because we don't control land and land resources, we lack collateral to be able to assess finance either from the financial institution to expand your agricultural activities. Secondly, we lack access to extension services. You cannot go into farming without trainings and capacity building on the new 
modern way of farming and technology for you to be able to increase production. And these factors, you know, sometimes women are not able to assess these extension services, which are very, very key to, you know, you know, giving you support on how you are supposed to do your farming activities. And one of the, uh, another factor is access to infrastructures. You know, when you are talking of farming, there has to be new technologies, new way of, you know, farming. But as it is now, women continuously use their food implement to do their farming activities. Am I lost? Yeah, your picture has gone, Mary, but you can carry on while it okay, hopefully reads. Okay. Yes, but you know, because women are not able to have access to these infrastructures, they continue to use their crude implement to do their farming activities. In December 2020, 2020 all the women gathered in Abuja and we decided to send our farming implement to the museum to be able to speak with government that unless they, they supply new technology to women, women cannot be longer be able to produce the food they want to produce. And it attracted a lot of attention of the government and stakeholders in the agri sectors. Another important issue that has been affecting us is the issue of involving women in budget and budget processes. You cannot sit down to plan for the women in their absence. Most of the time, government think that they can sit down, make plans in order for them to say, okay, uh, we are planning for women to be able to give them so-so number of fertilizer or so-so number of you know, seeds. That is not our demand. We expect that government at all points should be able to involve women in the issue of making budget and planning so that we can be able to track. The budget process in our government is not an inclusive budget process because you cannot plan in the absence of the person you are planning for. And we also, you know, lack access to planning of policies. Anytime government is making policies, they don't involve the beneficiaries of the policies. And we try to advocate around, you know, the implementation of government, government policies across within Nigeria and even outside Nigeria. Mary. And the organization continue to advocate for increase in the agri sector. We also advocate for women inclusion and policies in favor of women so that we can be able to track the budget. Mary, um, you know, the, you're the first one to speak about the government. And when I was living in Nigeria, uh, I was working very closely with the Ministry of Agriculture, FMARD, and the Ministry of Women's Affairs. Um, and I'm curious to know, you know, we worked a lot on the new policy, ag policy there. We looked at inheritance. Actually, women can inherit land now in Nigeria, but your point is, is correct that once they inherit it, they still don't control it. For the audience listening today, um, do you have any brief examples of, of interventions that actually worked? You know, my, my findings generally across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is that the policies aren't always that bad, um, not just agriculture, but the implementation is. You know, uh, I, you can import a policy from just about anywhere and tailor it. And I think there's a lot of good things that are written down in, in West Africa, and particularly Nigeria and Ghana, but they're not implemented like they should be. Therefore, you've got the issue of no who versus no how, who has access to money, who's related to who. You know, let's just not uh, enforce this particular rule. Um, so... What, what are some of the things, even small, that have actually worked to improve the enabling environment for, for women and other vulnerable populations? 
Um, some of the things that have worked for us as women uh, is actually working around influencing the budget. You know, mm -hmm. we talk to the government, we do an advocacy visit to know the budget cycle, mm -hmm. when the budget is starting, and that is where we influence the budget. If the but if the the, 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 the is it is captured in the budget, we can be able to track it and follow it. Like in 2020, there was an allocation of you know procurement of a farm input for smallholder farmers. We advocated for that. And when that one was included in the budget, we tracked it, we continued to follow it, and the Minister of Agri was able to, you know, distribute farming machines, impute and seed, and he involved smallholder women farmers. That was as a result of our advocacy. So inclusion in the budget process have worked for us. If you know you are captured in the budget, you'll be able to track the budget. And it is not easy for you to be able to understand the budget process. If your capacity is not built, you won't know when the budget is start starting and when it is closing. And that is why we continue to talk to them that they must include us in the planning process if they actually want us to, to, to benefit. If they include us in the planning process, we will be able to know that yes, our government have voted this in favor of smallholder farmers. But all other things that we are not aware goes on air. We cannot track it and we don't know where it goes. And sometimes it is the political farmers that take over those things. We don't have access to it. So this advocacy have actually worked with us. We are not farming. Even within the communities, we've been advocating to our traditional rulers that when they should give us land and even to our government, we've been advocating and we have had some success stories, some state government have allocated land for only purely women. We have about five states that have allocated about 200 hectares of land that women should use it at free of charge. This is as a result of our advocacy. We need to make our issue known and we need to speak with one voice and we need to speak as a movement. And when you speak as a movement, government listens to you. And that is why in 2018, all the women of Africa that gathered to climb until Kilimanjaro, I was one of the climbers, were able to get the attention of the uh, African Union to speak with them on the issue of women access and control of land. And they took it up at the African Union level, right down to all the African states. So it has become a tool for us and it's given us opening to be able to engage with government at all levels for us to be able to have access to government resources. Very good, very good. We're, we're running out of time, so I'm gonna ask one more question, but if you could answer it quite quickly, that would be great. It's the, the question of the year, of the past two years, I guess. But what is, uh, how has COVID-19 affected the women in agriculture? And this is an odd question, it's affected everybody around the world. Uh, but this particular question is, if you have an answer, is how has it affected women in agriculture in Africa? Thank you very much. I think uh, this COVID has come to deal with women farmers more than any other sector of the economy. During the COVID-19, we lost all our investment. We could not take our produce to the market, neither could we even have access to buy input to do another production. So women farmers lost all their investment. So what they are doing now is they're starting all over. And with the insecurity we are having, we've been able to speak with government that they need to you know, increase investment in the agri sector or else it will not be able, we will not be able to feed the nation as it is because a lot of people are not able to go back to the farm because they have lost their investment. But haven't the men also lost their investment in an equal basis for smallholder farmers? Uh, the, the men have been able to, they lost their investment, but they have a way of, you know, recouping from the loss they have made. They have other things like uh, palm fruits, mangoes, uh, banana that they plant that they can harvest and sell. And women farmers, because they don't control land, they cannot plant cash crops. You only depend on planting crops that you can harvest within two, three months. 
So the men were able to fall back to their cash crops, which they harvest yearly, yearly and yearly. So they are falling back on that. But the women don't have where to fall back on. Right. Well, I, I appreciate that. And your, your main point about being part of the decision making, the budget process, and just having an inclusive uh, as well as conducive enabling environment makes a lot of sense to me. You know, I, I, I did, a, I've done a lot of gender work over the years and um, I often work with women's groups and I tell them, well, you need to get some men in here as well. Uh, you can't, it's just not a women issue. The men are half, if not more than half the problem. So if you're really having a, 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 a holistic debate on what's affecting women and how to fix it, you've got to get uh, plenty of men champions on the team. And I, I find that's often lacking. Um, but thank you very much, Mary. You made some great points. It was a pleasure. Um, try to turn your, your, your camera back on if you can. We miss seeing you. Yes, yes. I was try, I'm trying to turn my camera back. That would and be I, great. I wish I could have more time to share some pressing issues and some pressing well, things. And if I couldn't share, I think I will write them and post them. Please do or send them to me and I'll put them in the summary of this event that will be posted on the Global oh. Policy Institute website. But there's going to be some Q&A at the end so you have another chance of expressing uh, you. your points. You. Um, last but not least, <laughs> Tucci. Our final speaker is, is Tucci Ivawi. Uh, Tucci is the Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana Commodity Exchange, also called GCX. Um, he's an experienced business leader with over 20 years experience in, in marketing and general business management, including 15 years as the executive director of Nestle's Central and West Africa region. Tucci, welcome. It's good to see you. And uh, yeah, you can turn off your, your mute. Um, just, just to start everybody off on a level platform, could you briefly describe what the Ghana Commodity Exchange is and does, including a, a, a simple definition of, of structured finance or structured trade in this context? Thank you. Sure. Um, it's a marketplace. So we, um, we don't trade, but we bring buyers and sellers of commodities together. So if you are a farmer um, and want to sell your commodities, you can come to the Ghana Commodity Exchange. If you are a buyer, be it a processor, a manufacturer, someone who's buy another farmer wanting to buy feed, for example, for poultry, you can come to the exchange. So essentially, the Ghana Commodity Exchange is there to provide access to markets. That's the primary um, uh, goal. But a secondary goal is to also provide access to finance. This is what it is in a snapshot. So if people know the concept of, uh, let's say Amazons and Ebays, the commodity exchange functions in a similar manner where people go to buy a product, they don't know who's behind it, but they're looking for a particular specification standard um, and they go to, to buy anonymously. Um, and it can also be likened to a stock exchange, except that instead of stocks being traded, it's commodities. And it's a new organization. It was established in 2018 by the government of Ghana. And we started um, by facilitating the trade of agricultural commodities. So that's hopefully in essence covers what we do, but I can share more detail later, especially if there are questions on it. Um, no. I thought it was- Go on, go, go on, please, go on, please. Yeah, I said it's, it's, it's good that you made me kind of launch into that because um, I was very um, excited listening to my colleagues speaking just now and I'm not going to repeat anything um, they've just said um, because all the points are, are relevant and they cut across West Africa. Some of the similar issues you'll see in Nigeria, the same in Ghana, in Cote d'Ivoire and so on. One, um, I want to come from the point of the smallholder farmer and the value they can get after farming their, their crop. And this is men and women farmers, but I want to talk about the role of women because that's why we're here. Just to share some stories from my background. I mean, when I was with Nestle, we used to travel all across Central and West Africa, go from market to market, and we'd see similar trends everywhere we go. You'll go into wholesale um, outlets, retail outlets, and you see the shop sign. Often it's a, a religious name like to God be the glory, that's the name of the shop, but often it's the name of a man. 
um, and that's the name of the store. And then you go in and you find that it's a woman who is, um, you know, in charge of sales and in retail and the man is nowhere to be seen. So you find that it's actually the woman's idea. She established the business, but she uses the husband's name because there's a, you know, there are social norms and, and you know, you don't want to look like the woman is, is, is heading the business when the man is, is not doing anything. And so there are issues at the farm where yes women are, are suffering because they don't have titles to land and so th this is a, a block when it comes to accessing finance if you've got no collateral you, you don't you're not able to access finance and even when they go beyond the farm they're having some um, challenges but you'll see that the majority of women are trading if we talk about farming today as a business no longer a subsistence farming yes we farm to but beyond that, we want to make a living and we can make a rich living depending on how well we structure our, our, our businesses. Today, we're talking about farming as a business. So once you've farmed, once you've produced your, your crops, you need to sell them. And that's why I'm saying that women have a very positive and a very strong role going forward because women are already ahead in the trading game. The numbers, when it comes to production, you have more men than women, but when it comes to trading, you have more women than men. About 70 to 80% of trading of agricultural commodities across the borders uh, of Central West Africa are, are female dominated. So if women can farm their produce, now they can sell them and hopefully you know, derive value. And this is one of the roles the Ghana Commodity Exchange uh, comes to play. We are, the, the program is not designed for women, but it benefits women as much as it does men because it provides a level playing field. So maybe I can talk about some of the positive interventions and how it's um, helping women to, to become more empowered or let's say to become more enriched from their business, if that's okay. Yeah, that's, that's fine. I wanted to ask you about the GCX and I know it's open to everybody, but uh, to, to see what the activity level of women is now and what you expect it to be. You know, I was always surprised when I first came to Africa many years ago when women in agriculture was subsistence primarily. And when it got into processing or, or, or growing, there were certain crops that were women crops and there are certain processes that were women processes, I mean, parboiling rice, for example. But it didn't really make that much sense to me. And nowadays, with mechanization and digitization of Africa, of, of agriculture, and, and uh, s small tractors and remote sensing and smart tractors, you know, it, the, the, the gender divide is less and less and less and less. So I, I don't, unless it's just what Mary referred to earlier of the social norms and the culture, I'm, I'm curious to hear what you are seeing in the trends of women in agriculture and women participating in the GCX. Um, as currently, it's about 30% participation women versus men. Um, I think it's because it's still very early days. Um, I was mentioning the fact that people are bringing agricultural commodities to trade. And when you talk about trading, women are always interested, but it's a slow and steady game. So about 30% of the participants currently are women. Um, when they bring their commodities to trade at the exchange, it's a fully modernized electronic platform. So, and we're very open, it's a membership based organization, but a large proportion of our current members are smallholder farmers. We've worked with the Securities and Exchange Commission to allow smallholder farmers to become an entrance um, and to trade on their own behalf. So we're already breaking down these barriers. Um, and so you're finding that smallholder farmers, men and women are coming to trade using an electronic platform to trade their commodities. So people often ask, but do they, under, you know, are they able to use computers? Do they understand technology? Um, the, the, the point is that we're bridging agriculture and technology, and this is becoming more attractive to the youth. When you talk about the youth, women as well as men are very excited to enter. So we've been you know, running a lot of um, road shows, a lot of outreach programs, and you're finding that women are coming up more and more to say that they want to enter into agriculture because they're seeing a future. And I think it's that bridge with technology and agric that's making it, it's, it's becoming a business. It's no that's longer the, the, the grandparents and you know, trying to move from the village because it's, it's a small business. So this is really um, opening the doors. That's a key message, Tucci. Before the, the smallholder farmers were trading on your platform, um, 
who is doing the trading? Is it usually the industry association or is it, uh, or is it the uh, large aggregators? Um, both. You have the large aggregators, you have farmer based organizations doing trading, um, and they're able to shift a lot of volumes. You have the large uh, processors going directly to farm gate, and this is where they're just taking products from smallholder farmers without paying the correct value. Um, so, so these are some of the things that we're hoping to see change very rapidly as the exchange is providing access to critical information such as price information on a daily basis based on standards. So no longer, you know, just producing one size fits all commodity. Farmers are getting paid a premium for higher quality commodity. And as they're understanding that, they can ask for better pricing. And here, and, and this is why it's exciting, because women are very savvy when it comes to trading, when it comes to margins and so on. Having this type of outlet which distributes information freely for all members and all clients of members is, a, is really empowering them to say, no, I know that I can get this much for my commodity now. So, you know, they're able to right. negotiate. So this I is think, the No, I think you're, you're also somewhat touching upon re, not removing the middlemen or the agents, but um, shortening the, you know, the, the path to prosperity in the path to sales and that may uh, that may rub some people the wrong way so i'm curious what you if you've had any kickback from the agents which usually live near the farmers have personal relationship with the farmers and seriously take advantage of the farmers buying during the glut and holding it and selling when it's it more more profitable and that leads to another point which we haven't discussed before and you may or may not want to address it it's up to you but that's the level of trust in the system and the, the the ability for women to trust versus the ability of men to trust you know one of the things i've noticed in east africa some of these associations are thousands of members you know one association in t 18000 members in in west africa the co-ops let's call them co-ops or associations are much much smaller like 25 and that certainly has something to do with trust but i'll leave that with you if you care to answer it okay um i think on the aggregator or the middleman um you know story the exchange is extremely open we try to encourage a free market and say there you know this is not the only way the open market is still there but this if you come this way this is what you'll get and Aggregators are also part of the platform. So farmers who may not be ready to trade on their own behalf or join a, a commodity exchange can still go through an aggregator or a broker. Mm -hmm. What it's doing essentially is creating new jobs. So um, your aggregators or your farmer based organizations are deciding to set up brokerage firms and then they're trading on behalf of farmers. So they they, they make money as well. There's a margin, there's a, a fee for the brokerage services for the farmers who don't want to do it themselves. They'll take a fee. However, the farmers at least now are informed because then they become clients of these brokers on the exchange and they also get the price information on a daily basis at the end of every trading day. So the broker is now working on behalf of the farmer to get them the best prices, but they will also make money. So we're actually not shutting anyone out. We're saying that we're providing a fairer market. And if this is done well, and we start to add other commodities, cash crops and so on, we're expanding markets for everyone, both the aggregator and the smallholder farmer, because we can link to global markets. So this is the way we're, 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 we're slowly developing this market to be inclusive. When Great. it comes to access to finance, I'm bringing this in now because you also mentioned, you know, the idea of um, hoarding commodities selling at a later stage. The commodity exchange allows you to um, store your commodity and then sell it um, in a couple of months when the prices are higher so that you can benefit as a farmer from higher prices. You can do that directly or you can do it through a broker. But if you're a farmer today, you need cash usually immediately, um, you know, to, to, to start preparing for your next harvest or to simply look after your family, but you also want a, a, an equal chance to participate in this type of um, trading to get better prices. So with the banks, we started to, we've developed a product, um, warehouse receipt financing. So traditionally where anyone would have to go to a uh, bank with uh, land or house um, or a car as collateral, to get a loan, if you have your warehouse receipt from the Ghana Commodity Exchange, which is essentially a title to your commodity that's stored in our warehouse, 
that is the sole collateral you need to access a loan from these banks that have partnered with us. So a farmer who has 20 bags of maize can actually take his warehouse or her warehouse receipt to the bank, get financed for that, um, sell it, you know, three months later, bank loan back and still get higher margins because the price has appreciated. So this is where we're really saying we're, we're giving equal access to men and women because all you need is your, your commodity as collateral. And we're encouraging right. as, a, as an exchange, we have a target to um, make sure 50, 50, um, there's a 50, 50 benefits or representation from men and women and access to finance. So we, we think this is really going to change the game. It'll take some time mm -hmm. for more people on board and more banks to come on board, but we've already got a few banks offering this product and your commodities are now a security. Thank you. That. We're, we're running out of time, Tucci. I have one more question, but uh, what you just mentioned is, you know, in, in Nigeria, uh, I had the experience of, of some banks offering women loans at a lower interest rate because the repayment rate is so much better. And if we could leverage on that, that would be uh, a nice competitive red flag for men. And that's how we react generally. That the question is, um, is you know, when, when women benefit, the families benefit, the children benefit, the community benefits, it's clear. So just a, a very specific question. If you were uh, the Minister of Agriculture or the President of Ghana, you had the power to do what you wanted and, and your goal was to make sure the women are better off financially. Let's just make that the goal. It's, it's finance, improve li livelihoods through greater uh, profitability in their, in their farms, and you know where the benefit's gonna go. So what, what has to happen? I mean, what would, what would need to change, be it a government, be it a, the women, be it the men, be it the climate change, you know, maybe some things are not controllable, but what, what are the things that would have to change that would have the quickest and more, most sustainable impact on improving the, the, the revenues of women in agriculture? I think it will go back to history and what um, both Ivana and Mary have mentioned about ownership and land ownership. Because once you have stock of, of, of your produce, I 100% believe that women can possibly generate even more revenues than men because they are that commercial, uh, you know, that commercially savvy in this part of the world. But if they don't have access or ownership to the land in the first place, they, they when we talk about things like access to inputs and so on, if you're already starting on a level playing field where women are owning the land and they essentially own the farms that they're producing from, they will get um, these access to inputs the way that it's being run, at least in Ghana. So you're kind of taking it all the way back. Um, and, and, and I think that will have a ripple effect um, across the chain. Thank you very much. Sorry. Tucci, uh, really appreciate you being here. You know, um, I think you're, you're really breaking some ground there in, in Ghana uh, in being able to collateralize these agricultural commodities and through the exchange. And based on the experience I've had working with Ayodeji, you know, in, in the Apex exchange in Nigeria and Ethiopia and Kenya and South Africa, I mean, I think there's potential for the exchanges to somehow connect at some point and even broaden the marketplace if we can get the, uh, the cost of transport down, which is way inflated these days due to uh, a lack of competition. But thank you very much. Uh, that, that concludes the presentations, the formal presentations. And with the remaining time left, uh, as we said, let's open it to the floor uh, to see uh, if you have any other questions. Um, let me just look and see here. Here's a, a, a I don't know who's it, who it's from, um, but this is a question, uh, I guess, to any of you, which is about the... Um, the opportunity to to transition from subsistence agriculture to profitable agriculture and and uh and the size of the farm you know there's the, the question is about what is 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 there a certain amount of land is there a certain amount of skills or a certain amount of money required to be a commercial farmer of course it depends on the value chain but uh versus you know how what what's the situation with the large commercial firms 
that have, have 500 hectares or something like that and are producing for the big players, the Nestle's, the, the, uh, the Unilever's, et cetera, et cetera, versus how can smallholder farmers ever get the voice and ever afford to be commercial? Um, open question to any of you if you'd like to answer. Who wants to go first? Ivana? That's got to be, that has got to be a trick question, really, I think. I mean, the commercial, what happens uh, many times is that you have, it's not an or, it's an and. So you have the commercial farmers working with the um, smallholder farmers. I mean, for instance, I run a seed company. And what I did was I had um, outgrowth farmers, and those were the smallholder farmers. So I would give them inputs, you know, I would give them fertilizer, I'd give them seeds, I'd provide extension services education for them and at the end of the season I would buy their crop. So I think, you know, by by them interacting with the commercial farmers, they get hungry because they see the success. They get curious. They want to learn. And by working with the uh, commercial farmers hand in hand, they also grow over time. So I think that's one way that um, smallholder farmers can grow. You know, I think the other thing also is, I think Mary mentioned this, is really about deployment of technology as well. Because many times, um, you know, they're using, it's very labor intensive, they're using old practices, education, technology, and I think working with commercial farmers help them to scale. So I hope that answers the question. That yes. Was, anyway. Mary or Tucci, anybody want to add to that or is that okay? Yeah, what you want to say is actually true. Um, working with the commercial farmers, is something we are actually moving towards in reaching because what actually makes us to be small is the issue of lack of access to land and land resources. So what we normally do is uh, when you produce crop, you have the commercial farmers that, you know, sometimes they know the particular type of crop they want. So what they normally do is they come to our organization do you have space to produce this? Now we share this, you know, seeds to all the women farmers after producing, they aggregate them together and they uptake. But the issue is when they uptake from us, they are going to add value and sell. And in the addition of that value they are going to have, my name is not there. The producer, the real producer of that crop, my name is not there. So we want it to be in a sort of a partnership. How can we partner together? Can you bring your resources? Let's move together. So that by the time you are packaging, it will carry the name of the cooperative that produces it processed by somebody. But the commercial farmers add value to this product and forget about the real producer of the product. And that is where we have been having a lot of challenges. Let's collaborate together. Let's move together so that our identity will also be identified. One day we would also move from being small scale to at least a medium scale where you can add value, process, and even export. That is the vision we are looking at. How do we add value to the product we are producing? Sometimes when we have glut in the market, these big farmers, sometimes when there is glut, they will not come to buy. You are allowed to stay there with it, but if you can add value, you can keep it and sell it at the time you want to sell. So let it be a collaboration together so that we can both build each other to a certain level. As it is now, we are working for the, you know, the big farmers. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mary. I have another question about cooperatives and farmers associations and and again the question relates to how do you get more voice to the smallholder farmer you know entrepreneurs in any sector are fiercely independent and it's hard to get the sme msme voice ever anywhere that i've worked in the world so in farming you know the the, the simple logic is uh, strength in numbers you can collaboratively come together and purchase inputs cheaper you'll have more of a voice in negotiating the sale um, and, and perhaps more of a play with the off-taker in terms of the off-taker providing some, some input finance or some training, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the farmer associations and SACOs and things like that that support the farmers are relatively small 
in, in West Africa and wondering why that is the case. And, and is there potential for these to get even almost a community block farming model where individual farmers will still own their individual 0 0.25, 0 0.5, one hectare, but they'll come together and put together 500 uh, hectares that are contiguous. And therefore you now need one tractor that can go through everybody and you share the cost, et cetera. What's, what's, what needs to happen to make these co-ops uh, stronger and more impactful? Anybody? Uh, just, just like I, as I, sh I shared, uh, what we are actually doing with our government, because the reason why you have these women in fragmentation is because they don't have the land. They have the land is they will give them small 0 0.1 hectare here, 0 0.2 hectares there. So it's not easy for them to bring their land to one place because the land is not movable. But if government can allocate land to this cooperative, it can give them vast hectares of land. And that is what we have done in Nigeria. We have about five states that the government have allocated more than 200 hectares to women. And tractors used to come there and you know, share it according to cooperative and they do their farming. And in fact, a lot of investors are coming to uptake their crop because it is in one place. And that right. is what we are looking for. We are actually advocating to government. Since these women are not able to have access and control land, government have land. This land should be allocated to women so that they can do farming according to their cooperative. That is what we are advocating now. And by the grace of God, in all the 36 states, we are going to have cooperative land for all the women farmers in those states. Excellent, excellent. Tucci, let me ask you the final question because we're, we're pretty much out of time. And, and that, that question is about extension. It was mentioned earlier. And, and again, my experience in public sector extension services is not particularly impressive uh, as around the countries I've worked in. Uh, the, the, there's far too few extension agents. They're usually trained in a general agricultural specific, uh, uh, at curricula. So if someone has a specific problem with, with palm or, or sour gum or, or uh, maize or rice, they don't, they don't have that specificity or livestock or poultry, yeah. etc. Uh, some of the private sector people who are off taking have, have some good models in reaching back to their farmers and providing them what is needed, including input finance, which they get paid back at harvest. But generally the question is, you know, how do you improve extension services no matter where they come from? Because that is such a, a lack across the board of training, technical assistance, both, both, ag, both you know, agronomics and, and global accepted practices gap, uh, but also business, business decision making, financial literacy, leadership, group dynamics, etc. cetera. How, how can we fix this? What would you do? I would do a combination of actually the, the, the question you just posed, which is how can we encourage commercialization and you know really um, turn this into proper business? I don't think we'll really in the next, I don't see in the next 10 years, any part of West Africa solving this issue with extension workers. You're going to have too few um, to the number of farmers there are. There are countless development partners um, deploying countless programs um, across the, the region and you see a cycle, you know, they'll do it, they come on a five-year program, and then their main headache is how is this going to be sustainable once they, they leave and the funds, you know, come. and it's the same story and it's not changing. Um, so I think, you know, really putting a commercial approach to this and saying, let's partner with private sector. Um, and private sector can come in many forms. You have local industry, you have international industry, but, you know, coming with some agreements that benefit all parties, from, as Mary said, the producer to the mm -hmm. investor to the government, because it's in government interest to um, make sure that um, there's an economic transformation through agriculture. If we want to become truly industrialized nations, it has to start on the farm. So I think this, uh, you know, strong partnership with private sector, um, you know, injecting um, resources, both government and private sector resources into this and building commercial um, awareness and commercial specialization is the key. I think every um, farmer can become a specialist 
extension agents will start to reduce as specializations um, you know, emerge within the farms and the businesses. So that's, in a snapshot, that would be my direction. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, Tucci, Ivana, thank you so much. Uh, we've, we've run out of time, it went by fast. Uh, but before closing, I would like to express, ex expressly thank you as the speakers who donated your time and attention to this webinar. I know you're passionate about it, as am I. Uh, but I also want to thank the Global Policy Institute and Bay Atlantic University for hosting this, especially GPI's president, uh, Paolo Von Schira, a, a dear friend and a, an incredible individual who has his fingers in as many pies as anybody else I know. He's also uh, GPI's executive director. Uh, uh, and Denise Caritas. Now, Denise's picture wasn't on today, but she's the one behind the scenes who's making this happen. She's the one who, who uh, without her, this would not have come across. Thank you for keeping everybody on their toes, sending us our links. Um, it's, been a, it's been a great discussion. And lastly, I wanna thank the participants uh, for your interest and commitment into one of the most serious challenges and enormous opportunities we face today. And it's not only in Africa. I hope to see you all again soon for our next installment, our next webinar in the Sustainable Agriculture in Africa series. Uh, we are toying with two topics right now. I think they both will eventually come to be. One is the digitization of Africa, uh, which includes fintech and mechanization and remote sensing and a variety of things that are really changing the face of agriculture and making it more accessible and more interesting for, for women and youth who are gonna be key in the future and also vertical agriculture where you can see increased productivity in, in the realm of 300% and how that vertical farming might contribute in a, in, a, in, a, in a way to Africa, be it on a smaller scale or be it uh, you know, a national program. So again, thank you very much for your time and attention. I'm not sure, Paolo, if you have any final words to say, but uh, that's all for me and wishing everybody a happy, a safe and a healthy summer. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having us. Bye everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, it was a nice one. Thank, Thank you, you all. Nice Thank meeting you. you. Hope to be in touch with all of you soon. Thank Take care. You. Thank you.